I work with Danny Elfman a lot. He's a well-known composer. I've been with him for about 10 years. I think we've done about 20 movies together. Um, and the way I hooked up with him, the way I met him, I was actually an out-of-work assistant looking for work. And he was a composer that I liked his music. I was interested in working with. I found out who his music editor was at the time. And I contacted her and I said, I'm an assistant and I'm looking for work and I'd love to work with you. Uh, and she said, oh, that's very nice. Uh, I'll take down your information and bye. And about three weeks later, she called me back and she said, uh, are you still available? Are you still interested? And I said, of course. Uh, and she hired me to take over um, for her assistant at the time that wasn't working out. Uh, and that was on Red Dragon. Uh, and when I got hired, they were already on the dub stage. They'd finished scoring, they'd finished recording, so I never even met Danny on that movie. <clears throat> um, but she liked me enough that the next movie she did with Danny was Chicago. Uh, he wrote some, there's a little bit of score, it's mostly songs, but so she brought me back, and on Chicago was the first time I actually met him. And, um, you know, we did some more projects together. Eventually, that relationship fell apart with the music editor, uh, and he brought somebody else in. And so I thought that was the end of my relationship with him. And then they called me back, and they said, uh, you know, can you come help us out? And that was on Spider-Man 2, and so I came back, and I've been with him ever since. And then um, Bill Abbott is his primary music editor, and he's terrific. But whenever they need extra help, or if there's specialty things, because I'm also a composer, there are things that I can do that aren't typical music editing. So sometimes when it sort of crosses the line and it's a little bit of both, I get the call. Um, or if there's scheduling problems uh, where, for example, Danny has finished one movie, and you know once Danny finishes scoring that's not the end of the movie there's still you gotta mix the movie you know there's the final dub and everything so sometimes schedules overlap um, so Bill will do one movie and I'll do the other movie so uh, it happens so, so he's one um, I've worked with John Ottman on a few occasions um, <clears throat> again he works with Amanda Goodpaster usually uh, and she's fantastic, but I've gotten the call a few times either to help or if she's on something else and then he gets a project that wasn't expected uh, and she's not available, then I've gotten the call to fill in. And so uh, I've worked with him a few times and, you know, he does a lot of great movies. He does all the Brian Singer movies and things like that. There's directors that like to call me, you know, John Singleton. He and I met when he did Too Fast, Too Furious. I was brought in to help. Once again, I was brought in to replace somebody. It seems to happen a lot in my career. Uh, and we clicked and we became friends. And uh, so now whenever he has a movie, he calls me before he even hires a composer. One part of music editing can happen long before the composer is even involved. Um, and as they're cutting the movie and they want to show it to producers, to test audiences, uh, to the studio, they want to show something that looks as close to a complete movie as possible, which means you need music. So they'll hire a music editor to do what's called a temp score, which is short for temporary score, mm. um, where the job is to find existing music, usually from other movies, but sometimes classical movies, sometimes pop, sometimes songs, anything. You know, since it's never going to get used for real, I can use anything I want because it's just a placeholder. And I'll take that and I track a scene. So I grab, you know, say there's a big action scene and I go, oh, that action scene from John Williams from Minority Report. That cue would work great here. So you pull it in and you line it up and you watch it and then you start cutting it to make hits and you craft a score um, and often that becomes the template f 
for uh, when they are ready to compose. So you can be very, very influential in how the score, the final score, ends up without touching the actual score. And there are editors that specialize mostly in temp scores. There are editors that mostly work with composers. There are people who do both. Um, but a good temp score um, can really set the tone for a movie. And uh, I'm sure you've heard movies and you go, oh, that sounds kind of like this, or that sounds similar to that. Often that's because the temp score was something that they liked, and the composers are asked to do something in that vein. <clears throat> which I think most composers hate, because you want to do something original. Of course. Um, there's no issues with rights, because we never use it for the final product. So it's just for the work in progress. It's just behind the scenes. So it's not used in any part of the progress. It never goes out to an audience, to, you know, to a paying audience. It never goes out to anything like that. So there's no rights issues. You can just use anything you want, it's all going to get replaced. Um, and sometimes it got, doesn't get replaced. Sometimes it gets kept. There are, uh, if you look at um, the King's Speech, they use Beethoven's Seventh Symphony. And it worked so well that they decided to keep it. Every film you work with the director because you're the music's representative on the dub stage. Uh, usually the music editor interacts with the director even more than the composer. The music editor is the interface with the studio, is the interface with the cutting room with the director. So oftentimes when the director is working on the cut, he'll talk to the music editor and say, I want to try doing this, I want that, whatever. How is this going to affect the composer? Is it going to affect the composer? Do you think this will be a problem? There's a lot of conversations that will happen with the music editor um, before it goes to the composer. When I worked with Danny Elfman, for example, uh, the last film I worked with him was The Unknown Known, which is an Errol Morris documentary that just came out. It was just in Venice a couple of weeks ago, at Toronto this week. Um, the way we scored it because of the nature of it constantly changing and because of the schedule and Danny had to write the music relatively early in the process. Uh, so we knew there was going to be a lot more picture editing after he writes the music. He wrote about half the music to picture and the rest he wrote some suites and it was me re-editing the suites and other pieces of music. Um, from the time he composed till the time we were ready to record, we had a new version. Um, and I'm the one that had to recut it and recut it. And I think I, I had five or six versions from when we recorded till the final. So things changed a lot. Oh, so I was talking about how often you're the buffer between the director. Um, when you're doing the temp score, there is no composer. Sometimes the director isn't sure what they want the music to be. So your job is to experiment with them and show them what it can be and go, okay, here's a very contemporary way of doing it. Here's a very classical way of doing it. Here's a more old fashioned way to do it. Here's a more rock and roll way to do it. You know, whatever. You try different things and it's a lot easier to experiment as a music editor than as a composer because as a music editor, I might spend a few hours listening to a lot of music and going, oh, this could work here and that could work here. And in a day, I might be able to give a handful of options for a scene. A composer can't write that much music in one day in so many styles, and it's not practical to do so. To write three minutes of music could take 10, 11, 12 hours. To cut three minutes of music, depending on what it is, could take half an hour or, or a few hours, you know, it's much, much faster. I was the assistant music editor on Training Day, which was my first major feature film, and there's a rooftop chase fight scene towards the end of the movie. And Mark Mancina, the composer, wrote this really great big action cue. And once all the sound effects and everything was in, somehow it just didn't feel the same, it didn't have the kind of impact 
director decided he wants to try something different and go very dark suspense. So the music editor, Richard Ford, uh, basically sat there and started finding other pieces from the score that the composer had written, and he completely cobbled together a completely new way of doing that scene editorially. And stuff like that happens on dub stages all the time. Sometimes it's as extreme as that. Sometimes it's just the picture's changed and you have to make it fit. Sometimes, <clears throat> when I did Hellboy 2, we had a, an area where it used to be a montage with a song. And uh, Guillermo del Toro called the sound, uh, the sound supervisor and myself and said, I want to try doing something very different here. And he showed us an edit that was much, much shorter and it was no longer a montage. It was just a very quick thing. He's like, can you guys make this work? Okay. So what used to be a montage with a song, the song went away. I ended up having to find some score and make it work. So it's cool to sit with the kids and be able to show them something that they're, that's new to them. I gather music editing is not really something that happens a lot here. So to talk about music editing and open their eyes and show them what you can do as a music editor and how a music editor can help a composer and help the movie uh, is pretty gratifying. It's, it's really nice. Um, <clears throat> today, for example, uh, the kids completely tortured me. Giovanni had this idea of me demonstrating on the fly some editing. So we said to the kids, pick a song, a piece of music, anything. So they picked a song from uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers. And I got the song, downloaded it from iTunes right there, and then put it in Pro Tools. And then they said, okay, now make it 20 seconds. Okay, so I showed them how I can do it, and it was very eye-opening for them. You know, they thought, oh, this is impossible. And boom, 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 20 seconds. And it was very eye-opening. And then they pulled out a Tchaikovsky piece that's in 7-4. And they said, okay, can you make this 3-4 and then 4-4 four, four, and then make it 30 seconds? And so to be able to cut and show them just how much can be done and how it's done is really fun. And it's really, it was one of the funner things I've done since teaching here because you get immediate feedback. You get the, you know, ooh, ah, oh, laughing. You know, it's like when I try something that doesn't work, they laugh at me. When you do something that works, they're impressed, they clap. So it's really fun, you know, and, and it's a, and a, I've been very fortunate in my career. I've been very lucky. I've got a good career. So it's an opportunity to give a little bit back, you know, to the next generation and to more people. So I, I'm enjoying it. Yeah. Plus, Rome is a great place to visit. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome.